Dear ones, this morning, as we prepare our hearts and minds to sing, we are going to be singing one, one of Theo's favorite hymns, hymn number 23, Bring Many Names. We'll actually invite you to pull out your hymnals for this one. It's in your gray hymnals, uh, just to give our tech team a little bit of time to catch up. So we are, because we are going to be exploring the many different ways in which um, the divine is known and named. We will be singing all six verses of Bring Many Names. So please, pull out your hymnals. Please, 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 as we explore the many different ways in which the divine is known and named.
Good morning. As Rochester celebrates LGBTQAI plus pride, may we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gift, gifts of love and service to all humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected to this community and to each other. Come, let us worship together. As Clinton comes forward to light the chalice, please join me in saying our chalice words, followed by our affirmation of faith and the doxology. May we be a people of welcome, here to grow in heart and mind and spirit. And may we reach out to serve our community. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. At the General Assembly worship service, many of us attended it on Zoom last week, there was much talk of making our faith real. One way of doing that is through generosity. You're invited to give online by scanning the QR code in your pews or to drop an offering in the offering basket. For folks online, please click the link in the chat to give to First Universalist Church. Let's make our faith real by generosity.
Dear ones, on the second Sunday of every month, our church takes up a collection of food for the Nestor Street food cupboard. So I see some folks have already dropped their uh, food in the donation bins up here. If folks have food they would like to donate, we just invite you at this time to please bring it forward, or if you cannot, to raise it up in the air, and our, uh, one of our ushers or church members will come to collect it. Does anyone have extra food for our food cupboard donations at Nestor Street today? Of this day. 
this moon, this ever expansive opportunity for living. In prayer and discernment about widening our hearts, our spirits, our minds, our understandings, show us an expansive way. Help us lose the feathers of fear, of limitations, of predictions, of control. Open us to new truths. Open us to what we can learn when we truly question. Open us to joy and to pleasure and to wonder, even now, especially now, especially as our hearts and our minds are surrounded with anxiety at the state of our world, our countries, of our bodies. Connect us to the truth that there is still joy to be found in these days, in these moments. To the truth both and of human living, joy alongside the pain, love alongside the grief and heartbreak, expansiveness alongside the fears, love still in the midst of fear. We breathe in the presence of this sacred community. Let us breathe in. Breathe in the expansiveness we are each one of us called to. Let's take that breath. We breathe in the spirit and the love felt whenever two or more are gathered. We breathe in the love of ourselves, recognizing we need no one else to feel loved and secure. May we find a new way, a clear way, a path broader and bigger than we ever thought possible to the divine, to one another, and to ourselves. Amen. Let's take a moment now or share the quiet reflection to be in the silent sanctuary.
for reading this morning is an excerpt from an article of Queering Faith by a dear friend of mine, Alex Capitan. There are many truths about the word queer. Queer can mean strange. Queer can be a slur. Queer can be a self-identity term in terms of sexuality or gender. Queer can be an umbrella term for non-straight sexualities. Queer can be a political framework. Queer can even be an academic discipline. Queer theory was born in the early 90s as part of queer activism, which pushed back against the growing segment of privileged gay and lesbian people arguing that they were just as normal as straight people. Queer activism rejects the idea that normal is worth striving for and aims to tear down or transform oppressive social systems and structures like marriage, rather than just trying to ex extend them to benefit a few more people. Queer theory is rooted in a post-structuralism, post which teaches that there is no such thing as a single, universal, absolute truth. That there are always multiple, even contradictory, equally true interpretations and meanings of something. Queer theory also questions everything that is presented as truth based on social norms, like the gender binary. It upends and rejects those norms. Queer theory does not put stock in a static and immutable truth, capital T truth, about who a person is, based on the idea that they were born that way, that their gender, sexuality, race, or any number of other things about them was hardwired into them. Instead, it emphasizes the choices we make. It's first and foremost about what we do and how we experience the world, not who we are or how we identify. That sounds a whole lot like Unitarian Universalism to me. Unitarian Universalism also teaches that there are many experiences of truth and that all truths are equally true. It rejects dogma and fundamentalism. It teaches that our paths aren't set for us, our fate is not predetermined, we always have the ability to make a different choice. Unitarian Universalism teaches that it doesn't matter what you call yourself, it matters how you live your life. So to me, Unitarian Universalism is a clear faith. At the core of Unitarian Universalism is the idea that my truth and your truth can both be true even if they contradict each other. To me, queer can mean liberation, and to you, queer can mean a painful insult, and neither of us is wrong. Both of our truths are equally valid. This is the most powerful theology I can imagine. Some of you use worship the natural world. Some believe in reincarnation. Some speak to the ancestors. Some believe in a scientific method. Some follow Jesus or Muhammad or Gandhi. Some believe in a single God. Some believe in many gods. And some believe in no one. Somehow, not in spite of, but because of these many truths, we are Unitarian Universalists. There are probably as many different beliefs within Unitarian Universalism as there are Unitarian Universalists, and this is our greatest uniqueness and our greatest strength. However, in order to tap into our superpower as a religion, we can't just coexist without meaningfully engaging with each other's truths. We can't gloss over our differences and expect that they will never affect our relationships or our community. Queering faith means turning social conventions upside down. It means actively talking about our different beliefs, deeply sharing the practices that make each of us feel connected and grounded, and experiencing joy and wonder in how different they are. My queer faith teaches me that truth does not depend on you having the same truth. That when both of us can live from a place of truth, different truths, when both of us can come fully alive from those places of truth, honor each other's truth, and both of us will be free. There are many this morning. Dear ones, it is so good to be back amongst you. 
It is really good to see you all after being away for a few weeks and at the beginning of this Pride Week in Rochester. I would invite you, if you can look into your order of service or elsewhere for our church's information to see, we will be going to a uh, LGBTQIA baseball game this upcoming Wednesday. We will be marching in the Pride Parade on Saturday, and we even have a cheering squad that will be sitting along the sidelines awaiting us coming down the way and also cheering along everybody that's going. So please, yes, Connie's ready with the prophet. <laughs> Come out. Please join us. So important that we are there as a religious community. So important. My friend Alex, who wrote this reading this morning, and I share a few things. One of them being that we were raised Unitarian Universalists. So as a child, when I was asked about what Unitarian Universalism was, I would use the metaphor of a buffet. I would share with people outside of Unitarian Universalist communities that this church felt like a church where we could come together, learn about the stories and traditions of different religions, and then pick and choose what it felt like suited each one of us for our personal spiritual practices and for the spiritual ideas we studied and drew from as sources of strength and meaning. Of course, I didn't use such big words back then when I was 16, but I would say that this was how Unitarian Universalism was being presented to me, especially in the Sunday school program I was being raised in. Back in the 1980s and 1990s, we were teaching children and youth all about the traditions and religions of many faith groups, sharing with us that it was possible to take a little Buddhism here and a little Judaism there, or in a dash of Hinduism and likely a strong dose of atheism, which seemed to be the theological orientation of most of the grown-ups I was raised around especially the ones who had left their Catholic or Christian upbringing for a more inclusive religious experience. I'm going to say, I do not think that this is the Unitarian Universalism Alex is writing about. And I will say that this way of viewing religious traditions was about learning a bit in service of religious literacy or being able to be part of different religious communities at best, and was based in cultural appropriation and utility, and not knowing the cultural context in which these beliefs and practices were formed at worst. It was what I knew at the time. It was certainly true for me then. In queering our religious tradition, we are being asked, being reminded, remembering, to recognize and celebrate multiple truths. Unitarian Universalism draws upon six sources of belief, including direct spirit experience, words and deeds of prophetic people, wisdom from the world religions, Jewish and Christian teachings, humanist teachings, and earth-centered traditions. Who here has all of these memorized? Anyone? Oh, I actually did. She's also a minister. <laughs> I had to look it up. <laughs> We draw on these sources in a religion that is pluralistic, that acknowledges that people's relationship to the divine and to no divine are sacred. We know we can learn from traditions that are not our own, and we know that we can heal relationship to traditions that have caused us harm, and all of that lies in the queerest act of all, of truth-telling. To be queer is to disrupt the status quo. It is to be contrary, intentionally, not complicit. Bell Hooks reminds us in this quote, queer as not about who you're having sex with, that could be a dimension of it, but queer as being about the self that is at odds with everything around it and has to invent and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. I say it again, queer is being about the self that is at odds with everything around it and has to invent and create and find a space to speak and to thrive and to live. To me, this sounds like the Unitarian Universalist community at our best. It sounds like a place to come and to be yourself and to theologically be at odds with those around you. And yet, 
Can we risk actually speaking about what we believe with one another? Can we embrace queerness and risk being at odds with one another here? Risk saying things that are not easily accepted or may leave us open to being questioned or challenged. This is hard to do. And it is especially hard to do without truth telling. And in our realm, as a religious community, this necessitates telling the truth about what we believe with one another. It also necessitates recognizing that we are not an either or community, that we do not ask people here to be one thing or the other, that we drop the old and tired and dead beaten horse of the theistic versus atheist debate we've been having since the 1960s and lightly way back to our roots and truly live into the vision of pluralism that Unitarian Universalists set out to be in the first place. In the Unitarian Universalism I experienced as a child, one of the most damaging ideas I came out of that community with is that Christians were dumb. That these people who I lived amongst and was in community with in this New England coastal town had just not thought hard enough, had accepted certain truths that likely no one would believe if they were smart enough, believed in science enough, or any number of reasons that were listed to think that Christian people had not yet evolved to where we were. It is my hope that we are not continuing to pass along this legacy to our children now. It is my hope and the future of Unitarian Universalism to embrace a clear theology, to clear our view of what can be believed and held in this space, to be able to expand enough to hold both and that both people in this very room have been harmed by Christian theologies that were homophobic and misogynistic and transphobic and harmful. And there are people here who identify as Christians and are seeking a place where they can belong and be and be known. To clear this faith, to embrace a queer theology invites us to acknowledge that there is not one creed here that fits all. To clear this faith, we have to embrace the old words of one of our historic Unitarian ancestors who made way for religious freedom in the ways he knew how back in the day in 16th century Transylvania, Francis David, we need not think alike to love alike. And we must be willing enough to be vulnerable with one another to actually articulate what we believe with one another in order to mature as a faith, to embrace a queer theology that makes space for both and it would be impossible to just keep our beliefs to our, our beliefs to ourselves and hope no one asks. That sounds like the closet to me. Sounds like we need to be inspired by our many queer ancestors and friends who have taken courageous action in coming out of those closets and choosing to no longer live in secret. Patrick S. Chang wrote an introduction to queer theology called Radical Love, in which he identifies key sources for queer theology. The first being queer experience, the lived experience of LGBTQIA2 spirit plus people. <laughs> being placed at the center of theological reflection. The second being scripture and sacred text, bringing a queer lens and queer reading to what has historically been read and written about from a largely heterosexual lens. Marcella Althaus Reed specializes in reading Christian scripture, and specifically the Gospels, from the perspective of Jesus and his disciples as figures in a gay bar. It's wonderful. And it leads to beautiful and expansive possibilities for what Jesus was saying and what he was up to. The third being queer reasoning, using queer theory, just as Alex wrote about, to help disrupt binary and either-or thinking about a particular belief and theology, and the final being queer tradition. Examining beliefs and practices and theology through the history, words, and memories of the queer communities that have come before us. This is an invitation to explore how expansive our theology could truly be. 
This is an invitation to consider what it might look like to place queer experiences and queer tradition at the center of unitary universalism, rather than relegating it to the margins or asking queer people to act in a certain way to be accepted in our communities. And before the question comes up, the question that often comes up around this, are we becoming a gay church? I'd like to invite folks here to do your research and explore just how gay we have been from the beginning, y'all. We have been so gay from the beginning. To take a queer lens to the question, there will always be room for heterosexuality and cisgender views in Unitarian Universalism, and there is a necessity to embrace a queer lens for the future survival of our faith. One does not negate the other. No one is taking away anything here, but rather seeking to expand our theological discourse beyond what we have thought to be possible. To come back to our, around to our six sources, what might it look like to queer, direct experience? What might it look like to queer, direct experience? To hold personal, multiple, or to hold multiple personal truths alongside one another? To know that one thing was true for me at one point and another thing is true for me now? To hold that I can grow through my experience to come to different beliefs and nothing need be set in stone? To queer the words and deeds of prophetic people, I would say we can draw upon those words and deeds of specifically queer people, recognizing the wisdom and the power of queer communities. And just on a little side note, it used to be prophetic women and men, actually, in this source, until a gender fluid person advocated we change it at our denomination's General Assembly a few years ago to be more inclusive and expansive. How might we queer our understandings of world religions and traditions? by holding the multiplicity of beliefs contained in the single title of Buddhism, or Hinduism, or even indigenous ways of knowing, by learning from queer people within different traditions, and by recognizing that no one individual can speak for the entirety of one tradition, releasing the desire to categorize, or limit, or even tokenize in service towards understanding these traditions. We can embrace the mystery and the stance of not fully known. We can seek to clear our understandings of Jewish and Christian teachings through reading queer interpretations of Torah and Christian scriptures. Humanism has long been a main theological orientation for queer people, and there are no shortage of humanist teachings written by and for the queer community. We can embrace an earth-centered theology that is not necessarily grounded in this goddess-god dynamic. It honors the non-binary theological figures such as the goddess, G-O-D-D-E-X-X, -X, and many divine figures in indigenous earth-based theologies across the world who are not binary. We can hold and explore the hybridity of plants and animals and the earth found in the natural world around us, rather than attempting to divide everyone and everything into male and female. The opportunities for queering Unitarian Universalism are expansive and limitless. The ways we get there together lie in dialogue, discourse, and truth-telling with one another, in our willingness to tell the truth about what we believe. If you feel like you have your personal theology completely figured out and set in stone, this may be a hard religious community to be in. And it might be hard to embrace a queer Unitarian Universalism, acknowledging the reality that we and the world hold multitudes. We are here to be changed. We are here to be transformed. The beginning of this Pride Week in Rochester, let us commit to learning more about queer theology about queer theory and what these disciplines can teach us. Let us remain truly open to disruption, like we were this morning, and release the, way, the ideas of the ways we have always done it. Let us allow the illusion of either or to dissolve away, recognizing that it was a lie anyway. And may our faith be queer, not only in the present day, but certainly recognized in our historic tradition and embraced in the future that we are co-creating. Amen. Blessed be.
el de Jesús. As we make our way towards the sacred act of singing together, our final hymn is hymn number 1014, Answering the Call of Love. You will notice, if you look in your teal hymnal for the music, that, that there are some different words on there. Please note that composer Jason Shelton has changed the original words from standing on the side of love to answering the call of love to reflect an awareness brought to him by Unitarian Universalists with disabilities around ableist language. If you plan uh, to sing using the hymnal, I actually invite you to look around in your uh, pew to get a pencil or get a pen out from uh, the pew and cross out standing on the side of love. It's hymn number 1014 writing above it, answering the call of love. Let us actually just take a moment to really honor this new learning, to disrupt the way we've always done it, and to embody it in this church, in our bodies, in what we are doing. Today we will sing with the new lyrics, answering the call of love. And they're also up here on the screen. Please rise in body or in spirit. And let us join in singing. our chalice flame this morning, let us read together the words printed on the screen and in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside this hall to the world we live in until we are together again. As we close our service this morning, I'll invite you to place a hand over your heart and to take a look around at who is here with you this morning. 
For our folks joining us online, I invite you to turn your view to gallery view, take a look at who is here with us this morning. These are your people. These are the folks that we are queering our faith alongside. Let us remember this morning that our hearts beat as one, but we are called to be expansive and queer in how we see love expressed and believed in throughout our days, throughout our moments. We need to be reminded this morning of the sacred and the ever expansive ways the sacred moves and works in our lives. May you know, each and every one of you here, that you are loved, and may you go and be that wherever you may go to speak. Amen. Blessed be the name of so. Thank you. 